actually see that video while I was actually an animal trainer because it seems to me that every person who works with killer whales should have to watch that video. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so first of all, before I start, I just want to reiterate what the other speakers have said. Thank you, Darius. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for all the organizers, Patrick, for the awesome <laughs> audiovisual um, and last minute stuff, of course. Um, so my story is a little bit different than some of the stories that you've heard today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background how I got involved with the movie. But what's different about me and my involvement with this story is that I haven't necessarily, I haven't created a particular nonprofit from um, from my involvement at SeaWorld. This is more of a story about personal transformation and the willingness to step forward and just speak the truth that I know. Kind of probably more like Crystal's story. Um, just speaking about my experience and then being willing to look at what I thought was my experience and realizing um, actually I was told to see things in a certain way and then I learned that actually the truth was not what I thought that I knew and then coming to that place of like well now that I know this I actually have to get this information out to the rest of the world because I'm probably one of the few people on the planet who can speak this information. So I would describe myself more as a reluctant activist to start out with. I never thought that I would be standing here having this kind of conversation. And I've spoken to audiences all over the world over the past couple of years um, and even a little bit before the movie came out. I've been I've been doing this. So um, so I want to give you guys a little sense of my of my background and how I got involved in the film. So I will back way up for a moment and say that I grew up on Long Island in New York, so on the East Coast. I know there's a few other East Coasters here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Long Island or Long Island, if that's where you're from. And um, I had a pretty average childhood. I remember back when I was in first or second grade, they, they still had the uh, Jacques Cousteau's uh, Undersea World and Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom on TV. And I remember thinking, wow, I really want to maybe work with big cats or I want to be a dolphin trainer. You know, that was what I, what I thought I would do. And then as I got a little bit older, I thought, well, maybe I'll be a veterinarian. So when I was um, when I was 18, actually when I was 17, I got accepted to Cornell University, and I went to Cornell and up in Ithaca, New York, as an animal science major. And I spent four years as an animal science major, planning on going into the veterinary school. I worked in the animal science. I worked at the um, in the veterinary school in a bacteriology lab for about three and a half years while I was there. So my background in training was really science. I was science all the way, and if you couldn't see it under a microscope, as far as I was concerned, it didn't exist. So at one point, I'd even thought about getting into animal behavior studies, but it wasn't considered a hard science back then. It was considered a little woo-woo and kind of out there. And so what I really wanted to do was hard science and research. And so that was the direction I was going. And so, the, and as an aside, I'll let you know that I'm now an acupuncturist and I own an acupuncture center in Palmer, Alaska. So that's also kind of not where I thought I would be, but that's a different transformational journey. So um, right about when I was ready to graduate from Cornell, I had gotten a little bit disillusioned about going into veterinary school. My husband's brother was in the vet school. I spent a lot of time working around vet students. And it occurred to me towards the end of my years there that there were not a lot of really happy veterinary students that they were all really overworked and tired and exhausted. And I thought, well, before I make that leap into vet school, I want to do something you know, that just seems a little bit more fun and more interesting to me. And I thought back, way back to when, when I was a little kid, and I thought, what was it I really wanted to do? And I came up with, well, you know, I've always wanted to be an animal trainer at SeaWorld, but I doubt I'm qualified for that, but let's just see. So this is pre-internet days. This would have been um, 1989 when I graduated from college. And I had to go to the library and print out a list of every single marine park and aquarium in the country. And I think there was probably 30 some odd uh, places that had whales and dolphins. So I sent my resume out to every single marine park and aquarium in the country with my, you know, with, with my uh, resume and my, my, uh, my qualifications. I'd been a swimming instructor. Um, I was CPR certified. I'd had a little bit of presentation experience. Um, you know, that was pretty much it, plus my animal science degree. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll be able to get in on the ground floor somewhere. And I got a lot of rejection letters. And then January of 1990, I got a letter from SeaWorld of Florida in Orlando, and they invited me come down, to come down for an interview. So at that time, they didn't offer to pay for me to fly from New York. So I went down there on my own dime, and I did the, I did the interview. And in fact, before they interview you at SeaWorld of Florida, they make you pass a swim test. 
And so what they do is you get in a bathing suit and you have to stand in front of all of the current trainers there. You have to dive into the front pool at the Whale and Dolphin Stadium where the water's about 68 degrees, which sounds warm, but not when you're in a bathing suit. You have to dive down about 25 feet to pick up a weight. And then you have to swim about 25 yards underwater. And then they watch you swim on top of the water to make sure you're a strong swimmer. You pull yourself up out of the pool. You do a bunch of push-ups and sit-ups. You carry two big buckets of fish. Um, and ice, and then you speak on a microphone to see if you sound like you're out of breath. And if you pass that, <laughs> then you get an interview. <laughs> and um, so I was, I was a really strong swimmer, and I did pass the test. And, and um, as I found out later, really, the criteria is that you look good in the wetsuit. I mean, that's what they're looking for. They really don't care if you have a science degree. You know, I thought I was going to a prestigious um, institution as self-described the world's foremost facility for killer whale research study and display. I thought I was going to be doing actual science. As it turns out, that was not the not the case. But anyway, I did my interview. I got called back, and in February of, um, of 1990, I started working at SeaWorld of Orlando for $7.50 an hour. <laughs> and, um, and most people say, well, how could you even survive on that? And I had my student loans, and I had my, I didn't have a car payment, I had car insurance, and I had food, and I had rent, and I had a roommate. And so I was able to, in Florida in 1990, I was actually able to, to barely get by on $7.50 an hour. I think, how many people thought that uh, the SeaWorld trainer made a lot more money than that? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, most people think it's like, you know, you get paid a lot to do that because it's a pretty dangerous job. But I'll tell you, I didn't even, I wasn't thinking about it being a dangerous job. I can remember my first day at SeaWorld, I was picked up by one of the senior trainers in a golf cart and they drove me to the back area of the Whale and Dolphin Stadium and I sat in front of one of the back pools where there were two dolphins, Lester and Tucker, and they were just jumping up and down looking over the back wall and they kept doing these little bows up and down. And while the supervisor went in to discuss where I was going to go and where my uniform was coming from and who they wanted to pair me up with, I just stood there for five minutes looking at the dolphins and I thought, I am the luckiest person in the world. Like, I couldn't possibly, here I am in, at SeaWorld, and I'm staring at these dolphins, and I'm going to get to go in the pool, and I'm going to get to ride these dolphins. I'm going to get to play with these dolphins, and there's beluga whales over there, and I'm going to get to play with the beluga whales, and there's sea lions, and there's otters, and there's killer whales. And, of course, I was, like, 22 years old. Actually, I was barely 22 years old at that point. And when I didn't think, I was coming from this perspective of, like, how lucky I am. But what I never thought was, what about the perspective of the animals? And that's what SeaWorld's very good at doing. How many people have been to SeaWorld? Yeah, so a lot of you guys have been. And don't feel bad if you've been to SeaWorld because they're very good at controlling the message. They're very good at the, at the PR of, feeding, of having you feel like you've gotten something that you haven't really gotten. So coming from my, coming from my science background and, and perspective, um, I was sort of in a unique position to take this job because I didn't really think of anything from the animal's point of view. Um, the people who would come to the park and SeaWorld labeled as activists, who seemed to know a little bit about the animals and just wanted to, sta to stand there in the, at the front at the glass and watch the animals all day long. Um, I thought they were weird. You know, they thought they were having mystical communications with the animals and they would want to talk to the trainers every day about the kind of care the animals were getting. And I couldn't really understand the questions that they were asking. You know, why? Of course these animals are getting well taken care of. They're getting the best veterinary care they could possibly get. The trainers love the animals. I love the animals. You know, what, you know and the background that I came from was working with domestic animals, you know, working with cows, working with horses, working with pigs. So I thought if you can provide these animals with good veterinary care and you can provide them with food and you provide them with mental stimulation and you give them an interesting life, what's the difference if the animal's in a tank or in the ocean? And that's really the mindset that I was coming from. And I spent three, year, three and a half years working at the park. Um, and through the course of working at the park, I saw things that I questioned but I never questioned captivity as a whole. It never occurred to me to think, is it right to have these animals here? But I felt like there were things that I saw that were disturbing to me that I couldn't do anything about. And I knew that eventually that I would leave to try to get myself in a position where I could do more for the animals. And I'll tell you a couple of those stories. Um, one of the situations was a dolphin named Celeste. Her, her father was Lester, who's the first dolphin that I met. And then her mother was Shannon, who died before I got to the park. Shannon um, was a captive, uh, she was, sorry, she was a wild collected animal who developed a fungus infection in her jaw. And the veterinarians treated her, and unfortunately, she had a poor reaction to the antifungal medicine, and she died, not from the actual fungus, but from the medication. So, um, so Celeste grew up without a mother. And dolphins are, um, when you don't have a mother and in, in that particular society, you're kind of low dolphin on the totem pole. So um, how, how many people saw Blackfish yesterday? 
So some people saw how Tilikum was getting beat up by the other animals. Uh, Celeste was in a similar situation. She's a captive-born animal. She wasn't particularly dominant, and um, she would often get beat up by um, by the other dolphins. And they would they would they would they would push into her. They would rake her. They would push her to the side of the pool. And a lot of times they would try to get her so agitated that she would throw up the food that she'd just been fed, and then they could get her food. And this started, this started happening while, um, when I first got hired at SeaWorld while I was working at the Whale and Dolphin Stadium. So through the course of my first year, I saw this animal who was really friendly with humans. And re just re this was a particular animal that you literally could jump in the pool and just hug. Some of the other animals were much more food motivated. And they were just like, yeah, you got a bucket, I'll work with you. You don't have a bucket, see you later. Celeste was not like that. She really seemed to want human interaction. And um, so very slowly over the course of a year, I watched this animal who I love just starve to death because it became much more reinforcing or positive for her to throw up her food than it was for her to actually eat her food because that's what the other this because of this behavioral issue that was going on now what bothered me about this was that i was supposed to be an animal trainer so i was supposed to this was this was technically something this wasn't a veterinary issue this was a behavioral issue and as an animal trainer i thought this is something that i should be able to deal with and unfortunately, over the course of a year, Celeste did, in fact, starve to death. She basically was an anorexic dolphin. The last time I saw her before she died, they were trying to tube feed her. And she was basically a skeleton with a head. I mean, it was the saddest thing you could imagine. And there was nothing that the vets could do. There was nothing the trainers could do. It was just a behavioral problem that was an artifact of captivity. So that stayed in the back of my mind. Then there were four false killer whales that were at the, the Whale and Dolphin Stadium when I first arrived. And... Um, there was a little bit of, of secrecy around these animals. Who's seen The Cove, the movie The Cove? Okay, so The Cove is uh, directed by Louis de Hoyas, and it's about the dolphin drives in Taiji, and it's about, the, um, about how um, some marine parks and aquariums get animals from these dolphin drives. They're violent. These animals are in their family pods. They're driven into this cove in Taiji, and they're brutally slaughtered for meat, and the best-looking animals are then taken into the... Um, the, um, the marine park and aquarium industry. Back in the 90s, um, this was uh, SeaWorld maybe wasn't directly getting animals from uh, the cove, but they were getting animals from places that were getting them from the cove, and then they were bringing these animals into SeaWorld. So they said, well, we're rescuing them from these, these substandard facilities and we're bringing them into SeaWorld. So there were four false killer whales that were in our stadium, and several of them were very sick all the time. And so I asked a few of the trainers, what's going on with these animals? And I got they're from Japan. And I didn't know what that meant. I thought, well, maybe this is an inferior facility and they were very sick and they weren't well taken care of, but at least they're here and they're getting better veterinary care. So um, this was only two months, two or three months into my being at SeaWorld. Um, I came into work one day and one of these false killer whales was, um, was clearly in distress. She was swimming these very fast circles around the pool. She was breathing very rapidly. Somebody handed me a clipboard and said, Sam, go take respirations on Zori. So I, I dutifully got my clipboard and I stood in where roughly the area that she was swimming around and I counted, basically they wanted me to count how many times she was breathing every five minutes just to see what was going on. In the meantime, the vets were called from, uh, from wherever they were in the park and they came and basically all of us trainers watched this animal die. And if you've, I, probably nobody here has had the chance to see a marine mammal die, but it's a pretty horrible situation because they are air breathers. And so they're fighting for every single breath while they're struggling in their death throes. And what they normally do at a place like SeaWorld is they get them into a medical pool, which is a, a pool, it's a smaller pool that has a false bottom. They can raise that false bottom and they kind of beach them and get them in a sling so they can keep them breathing and it calms them down a little bit and they can give them some sedatives. But back then in 1990, they, um, well, I don't even know if they were giving them sedatives back then, but at that point, um, it was too late already. She'd already been in so much distress that it would have been dangerous for the trainers to go in. False killer whales, to give you an idea, are about 1,300, 1,400 pounds, probably 16, 17 feet long. So it was too dangerous for anybody to try to move her into a safe position. And what eventually happened was she started beating her head on the side of the pool and all of a sudden just threw up this huge amount of blood and then just slowly sank to the bottom of the pool. And that was it. And there was this silence. And then I heard one of the vets say to the other, damn, I thought we were out of the woods with that animal. And that was it. And then everybody went on their business. Zori was uh, taken by a crane out of the pool, moved to the freezer. They did a necropsy. I never heard anything else. So there were things like that that I saw. There were animals that, that died for reasons that I didn't understand. It was frontier veterinary care. Um, I came, again, from an institution that was well-known for their veterinary care. And, you know, there had been so much, again, I was working with cows and horses. There was so much research about cows and horses. 
and so much was known about these particular animals, it kept shocking me how much was unknown about these animals. For instance, at the time I was there, um, dolphins, uh, killer whales are actually big dolphins. They didn't have dolphin blood types, so they were infusing the dolphins with killer whale blood when they would need to do surgery. Sometimes that would work, sometimes it wouldn't. So anyway, after a year and a half at the Whale and Dolphin Stadium, I was moved to the Killer Whale Stadium, where I spent a year. And um, the year that I was at the Killer Whale Stadium, I happened to actually be there on the day that they moved the whale Tillicum, who, if you've seen Blackfish, um, he is the whale that was responsible for killing a trainer in 1991 at Sealand of the Pacific in Victoria. So um, Tillicum was a captive killer whale who was brought to Sealand of the Pacific with two female whales also caught from the wild and uh, was having some social issues getting along with these females. It was a very small pool, nothing like you would even see at SeaWorld. And, um, and he was a subdominant animal there. And eventually what happened in 1991 was he pulled a female trainer into the water after she slipped and fell and was trying to get out and kept her from getting out of this, this, this small pool. The, no, none of the trainers were able to re get her away from him and she eventually drowned. But what really happened was that Tillicum along with his tank mates prevented this woman from getting out of the water. So they were responsible for her death. When I was at, uh, in 91 when this happened, I was working at the Whale and Dolphin Stadium and the way it was described to me was that um, that this trainer, the trainers at Sea Land of the Pacific didn't know what they were doing and they don't wear wetsuits. So when she fell in the water, she died very quickly of hypothermia and all the whales did was carry her dead body around um, and then um, and eventually they were able to get the body away from the whales. So what actually happened 20, 20, uh, all that time ago um, was the story that I believed up until Don Brancho was killed in February of 2010. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit for you guys. I know it's kind of a complicated story. Is everybody kind of following right now? Okay, so in February of 2010, I am now an acupuncturist working in, um, in Palmer, Alaska. My husband Kevin and I have gone to acupuncture school. We have a practice um, and I, um, I hear on CNN that somebody's been killed by a whale in Orlando. And I immediately think it's got to be Tillicum because um, I, knew, I knew a little bit of Tillicum's history at that point, and I also knew in um, July of 1990, 1999 that he'd been responsible in some way for a park guest death. Um, somebody stayed after hours in the park in July of 1999, and they found him draped over Tillicum's body, again, naked, draped over his body in the morning, and, um, and nobody had a really good explanation of what that happened. Apparently there were no witnesses, and I can talk a little bit about that situation, but he killed two people at that point. So in February of 2010, when I just heard the little blurb on CNN, I thought, it's got to be Tillicum. It couldn't be any other animal. And sure enough, as the news cycle went on throughout the day, I heard that it was Tillicum. And although the trainer who was killed wasn't somebody I knew directly, she was hired six months after I left the park. So she knew a lot of the trainers that I knew. And in fact, every time I turned on my Facebook, it would say, do you know Don Branchow? Because she knows 30 people that you know. So there was a connection immediately for me thinking like, well, I'd been intending on going back to the park at one point. I thought I was going to go get my degree in uh, facility design and be able to make the, par the, the, the facilities better for the animals. Um, or maybe I would go back and actually get my veterinary degree. So I thought that I would actually have was going back to SeaWorld. I didn't really get disillusioned with the whole idea of animals in captivity until way later. So I had expected to go back there and through a lot of twists and turns in my life, I didn't end up back at SeaWorld. So immediately I thought, okay, this woman had 16 years of experience and I knew that what she was doing on the day that she was killed was nothing that I personally wouldn't have been doing because I knew the way the rules worked and that you didn't just decide to do something that, um, that the rules didn't dictate. That, that this woman had likely been putting herself in the same situation with this whale that she'd been putting herself in for 16 years. Something went wrong on that day and she was killed by Tillicum. So something started waking up in me and I started thinking about the whole situation and it made me start to question a lot of the assumptions that I made when I was working as a trainer. And so um, in, and then a lot of news articles started to come out and it turned out that the public was unaware that this whale had killed two people before, before he killed Don. And then one of my former colleagues who I'd worked with in 1990 um, spoke on CNN. And then Tim Zimmerman from Outside Magazine wrote, uh, wrote a story called Killer in the Pool. Has anybody read that? It's a, it's a great article, and it was the first in-depth article that looked at what goes on behind the scenes at SeaWorld. That came out in July of 2010, 
And right about that time, I was invited to be part of a group called Orca Aware, which was a collection of scientists and journalists and other former SeaWorld trainers. And we started just sharing information. And all of a sudden, I realized that um, I knew nothing about killer whales. I had had this idea of myself when I was working there that I, still that I was a scientist and I was teaching people something about these animals, that these animals were ambassadors for their kind and that it was inspiring people to care about their natural environment. And very slowly, this whole house of cards that I had built around being an animal trainer started to crumble. And I thought, you know, now that I'd found out what actually happened to Don Branchow, and I found out the true story of what happened to, um, to Kelty Byrne back in 1991, and I found out some of the behind the scenes stuff that it, what, this, this guy had been killed in 1999 that SeaWorld had covered up quite a bit of information, I thought, well, I'm probably the only person on the planet who was at Shamu Stadium in 1992, the day that this animal arrived from Victoria, and I'm probably the only person who knows that management or who knows and is willing to speak that management lied to their entire training staff about what this animal did at the other park. And so I have to be the one to speak. So that's why I consider myself a bit of a reluctant activist. It's sort of, it was a six month journey for me to finally be willing to speak. And um, at that time, there were three other SeaWorld trainers that I was in contact with. And we started to become sort of a, a hub for if journalists wanted information about this situation in SeaWorld's past, they came to us because nobody currently working for the, for the company was willing to speak. Um, SeaWorld's kind of a cult-like environment. And so anybody who's recently left the company or anybody who even left the company in the past five or 10 years, there's a lot of discomfort about speaking, about you know, being a whistleblower. You feel like you're betraying your friends. You feel like you're betraying the industry. If you ever want to work in the industry again, you don't speak out. So it was really hard to, to find people who were willing to talk anything but the SeaWorld party line. And so um, eventually, it was September of 2010, at 4.30 in the morning, I found myself on Fox and Friends in a little basement studio in Anchorage, Alaska, being interviewed by the host on Fox and Friends. And we were talking about whether or not if Dawn had had some kind of scuba gear on her back that day when Tillicum pulled her in, if she could have survived. And there I was, boom, on national news and seen by two million people. And I remember leaving the KTUU studios at probably 6.30 in the morning, thinking that the SeaWorld van was going to pull up and, and whisk me away <laughs> for speaking out because it, was, um, woo, <laughs> um, because it was so scary to actually put myself out that way. And I, speaking of scary, I might get stung by a bee here. Okay. You're going to be nice to me? <laughs> I think he likes the stuff on my hair. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, so that's really how it started for me, was, it, was this journey of um, listening to activists, answering the questions of journalists, and starting to think, what do I really know about these animals? You know, what's the truth? What's behind the scenes? And as my husband is really often says, it's easier to pretend to be the thing than it is to be the thing. And I realized that that's what SeaWorld was doing. Their whole message of education and conservation was just a veneer. What you really have is um, you have a circus. You're forcing animals that, in the case of killer whales, that swim 80 to 100 miles per day to live in these tiny tanks, one ten thousandth, ten thousandth of the space that they'd be used to in the ocean. You're putting them in unnatural social groups. They live less than half of their lives in captivity. Um, just because we give them a little bit of um, you know, toys or playtimes or interactions with the trainers doesn't necessarily mean that, we could, that we're meeting their needs in captivity. Um, even the quality of the food that they get, SeaWorld characterizes it as um, restaurant quality fish, but all it is is frozen, frozen fish. And when that fish, um, when it thaws, it loses a good percentage of its moisture and its mineral content. Uh, killer whales don't drink water. They get all of their water content from, from their food. So um, over, the, over the time of eating this, this food quality, they get lots of health issues because the food is not really meeting their needs. Things like ulcers, um, things like their, um, the, uh, if you've ever been to SeaWorld, you've seen a lot of the animals have their fins collapsed. It's called dorsal fin collapse. That doesn't happen in the wild. One of the, one of the proposed reasons for that is because of their food quality, also because they can't swim the distances that they would swim um, in captivity. So all of these things, just I started to learn more and more, and I started to look at things from the other perspective. You know, it might have been my dream to swim with a killer whale, but it certainly wasn't the killer whale's dream to swim with me. <laughs> and so once I saw that, you know, I, I really, it's like, I, the, and the more I knew, the more I felt like I had to get out there. So this group that I was in morphed into something called the Superpod, and we've had more and more people from all different directions coming in. I get phone calls, I get emails, I get uh, Facebook um, mails, you know, Twitter comments. People are like, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? 
And mostly, I like the quote from Luis Ahoyas, the director of The Cove, who says, well, what are you good at? Do that. And that's what I tell people. They're good at social media. They're people that are good at illustrations. They're people that are good at you know, putting together PowerPoint presentations. They're people that are, that are good fundraisers. And I am not standing here um, representing any particular animal welfare or animal rights organization. One of, the, one of the great things that this movie has allowed me to do is that I can go where I feel like my voice is going to make the most difference. So if um, you know, the Born Free Foundation last year, last fall, and they're an uh, anti-captivity animal welfare organization in Europe. They invited me to go do a 22-day, nine-screening, seven-country tour in Europe to bring this movie all over Europe because one of the lobbyists in Born Free felt like this movie, more than anything else, could unite all of the separate anti-captivity organizations in Europe. So I was able to participate in that, which was an amazing experience. And back in March, we actually, I came back to Europe and we showed the movie at both locations of the European Parliament, both in uh, Brussels and in France. And then in between those showings, we had a, we had a meeting of all the anti-captivity anti organizations in, it was 16 countries and 30 delegates. And we had a three-day meeting and it was the first time all of these anti-captivity organizations have come together. Um, one of the issues in the anti-captivity world I've discovered is that there's a lot of really strong personalities and a lot of opinions, and I'm sure those of you guys who run nonprofits know everybody thinks they know how to do it, and a lot of times people end up butting heads and they don't get anything done. And there's something about this movie that has even helped the um, long-established anti-captivity organizations to work together and to kind of cross-pollinate a little bit more. The other thing that's happened from the movie is something called the blackfish effect. And with the blackfish effect is kind of this decentralized way to get information out. So you don't necessarily have to be part of a particular organization to do something. People have seen the movie and they've done amazing things with it, things that I wouldn't have ever thought. So that's just one school. There's been schools all over the country, schools all over the world. And, you know, I, I can't take credit for any of this, basically. <laughs> this is just something that I'm watching happen. It's amazing. It's this organic effect of people waking up. And... Gabriella Cowperthwaite, the director of the movie, she's invited, been invited to a lot of groups and a lot of think, think tanks over the past year and a half. And people have said, how do I create a movie like Blackfish? How do I get people to wake up? And she's like, you know, I didn't create an activist movie. I, she, Gabriella describes herself. She was a filmmaker long before Blackfish, but she heard the story about a trainer being killed by a whale. And she asked a question, why would this trainer... Um, and this whale that have supposedly had this relationship for 16 years, why would this happen? And then she started looking into the story and she found that there was more than just one victim. It wasn't just Dawn. It wasn't Daniel Dukes, the guy who was killed in 99. It wasn't Kelty Byrne or Alexis Martinez who was killed in another park by a SeaWorld whale. It wasn't, these were not the only victims, but the whales were the victims too. And that was the perspective of the story that she told. She didn't go out to try to to create a movie to tell people what to do. She just really wanted to tell a story about the truth of what goes on at SeaWorld, and this is what has happened since then. So it's not like she had a particular formula or a recipe for how to, to catalyze this movement in society, but what I've seen is that, and this is why I really was, um, wanted people to see the movie yesterday, because my experience is that when people see the movie, um, it's like, I call it a gateway drug, like because there's something about seeing um, seeing these animals suffering in captivity and and having and everybody has that transformational experience because you get to see it from the perspective of the former trainers who went there thinking this is the best job in the world and aren't I lucky to realizing that the relationship that they had with the animals was more like Stockholm syndrome. It's more like you know the prisoners would have with their prison guards, you know, in the Dhamma brothers before they did the meditation practice. You know, it's like the prisoners are. So they don't have anything. So to have a relationship with the prison guard is like, it's great that they have that, but it's, it's, it's all they have. And really, they wouldn't choose to have that relationship if they weren't in prison. So it's, it's kind of like that. And to think that that's what's being promoted to the public and promoted to kids as something good and wholesome as, as you know, family entertainment to me, you start to realize that that doesn't make sense at all. And then and I also see this as a metaphor for what's going on in corporate America, right? I mean, this is, it's not a surprise that SeaWorld lied to its employees. It's not a surprise that ultimately the goal here is to make money. Killer whales are worth millions of dollars. But when you see it happening in a place like SeaWorld or you know, a place like Disney World, it makes you start to question everything that you were taught as a little kid about what's right and what's actually going on. And so that's how I see this movie. It's opening people's hearts in a way that it makes them question what are my beliefs? You know, what's important to me and how can I go and make a difference? And many people have come up to me after the movie and said, um, you know, I didn't see myself as, you know, I, I just wanted to have my little life and raise my kids and, 
and you know this and and be on this particular trajectory but after i see the movie i feel like i can't not do something you know and so it's having people go off in all different directions and figure out what that something is for them which is really inspiring to see and i have no idea where this is going to go but i can tell you that in the past two years since the movie came out um, first of all, SeaWorld stock has been steadily going down, but there's been a... Has anybody heard of AB 2140, the blackfish bill? It's, um, it was introduced in the California Assembly um, about six months ago. Uh, Assemblyman Richard Bloom brought it forward, and it's a bill in California right now to end uh, orca captivity, basically. They want SeaWorld to shut down the show, stop the breeding, stop being able to transfer their animals over state lines and uh, try to rehab the animals that can be rehabbed and the ones that can't move them into sea pens. So it got tabled in the Parks and Rec Committee, but it, there's a good chance that it will pass when it when it goes through the next time. So that's a big change. And um, and these are these are I think SeaWorld when when this movie first came out, they were not expecting. They've had the microphone for 50 years, and I think they really didn't expect that this was going to be more than a blip, and that they would have a little PR response to it, and then it would go away. But it's opened so many people's hearts. It's like the movement is not going away. And people who you wouldn't consider activists, like moms, like kids, you know, it's not just the what they describe as the radical animal extremists, <laughs> are, are speaking out in their own way and getting this information into the schools. I've Skyped into schools all over the country, et cetera. So anyway, I did want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Or am I good? OK, so if anybody has any questions on microphone? Yeah. If you have a question, you can you come to the microphone. Well, you just mentioned that bill, mm -hmm. and it only applies to orcas. What right now, it only applies to orcas. I think the thing about orcas is that they're um, they're the species that's getting the most attention. Dolphins don't belong in captivity either. Walruses, and you know, we yeah. can talk about. There's the non-human rights project right now that's trying to get rights for a, a chimp. I think his name is Tommy. Like any, if you think about chimps, whales, dolphins, elephants, uh, sea lions, uh, tigers, there's a, there's animals that I would argue that just absolutely don't belong in captivity. And focusing on those animals first is is creating the awareness. But you know, I, it brings up questions about zoos and aquariums everywhere. What are we actually okay. doing? Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say Monterey Bay Aquarium. Well, is, Monterey Bay Aquarium is a good example okay. of they're doing it much more right than a okay. place like SeaWorld. Like I have no problem with SeaWorld as an amusement park. Their roller coasters are great. Yay, roller coasters. Right. You know, but but to call themselves an educational and research facility is wrong. Monterey Bay doesn't have any large uh, cetaceans in captivity. They just have life-size models, and they get about a million visitors a year, and they are actually educating people. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the quality of education that you get going through Monterey Bay versus what you get going through SeaWorld, it's miles away. I mean, Monterey Bay is way better. So places like that, I don't have an... You don't, the thing is, the technology is there that you don't need to have. You don't need to torture whales for human entertainment to right. teach them something. And that's really what SeaWorld's arguing <laughs> in the end is you, there are these, there's great virtual technology right now. You can do what's called virtual whale watching. It's CGI whales. Um, they've got CGI representations of whales from all over the world, both their external morphology and internally, too. You can like look inside a whale, and it's interactive. Yeah. So you can project that on a screen, and kids can come up to the screen, and they can spin, and the whales will spin, and they can wave, and the whales will turn and wave, and they feel like they're interacting with real whales, but, but you, don't have to, um, you don't actually have to capture whales from the wild or breed animals in order to do that. So that technology exists, and, and SeaWorld could certainly be using their powers for good, is what I say, but yeah, they're not, they're, <laughs> they haven't done it. One last sure. thing that I'll let I'll oh, share. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> horse racing. Yeah. That's something that I had an interest in earlier in my life, mm -hmm. and then I kind of recently really just yeah. said, no, I don't think that's probably... Yeah, Something horse racing is, an, and again, when you exactly. start, that's why I call this a gateway drug. I mean, I didn't, I, even as an animal science major, again, I thought about it from a, um, the perspective of being a veterinarian and taking care of the horses. I wasn't, the, the, when you start, go on YouTube or just go on the internet and do a little bit of research, these animals are drugged up. Um, they're in so much pain. They're being they're being held together like by like you know by right. by drugs and pins and what I mean they're they're kind of like on they're very much on the edge of of collapsing at any moment. And the veterinarians are using extreme and they're using like they're they're injecting them with thyroid medication to keep them going. But lots of pain meds. They're totally doped up to do what they do. Um, I it's definitely cruel and inhumane. You know, greyhound racing the same thing. I mean, there's a lot of places you you can go with this and i think that again this brings awareness to just how humans in general how we look at our relationship with animals it brings it all into question that it's not is it right just because we can do it um is, is that does that make it okay and i would argue of course no yeah, of course, yeah. Farming, but that's yeah and and that's it well that's has anybody seen anyway. cowspiracy that movie <laughs> Cow 
Cowspiracy, great. Looks at um, how, I mean, most people know about fracking and its effect on our, our water supply, but in fact, the, um, the animal, um, the in industrial animal production is responsible for way more water waste than even the fracking industry by like geometrical proportions. It's like 650 gallons of water to produce one Big Mac. That's so, yeah. Right, yeah. That film actually yeah. can be played tonight at 5 o'clock today oh. at the Veg Fest in great. Day Park. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So that's a great movie. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to depress you guys further, but like the one thing everybody can do is stop eating you know, stop eating food from factory farms immediately, and that would make a huge difference. So yeah, that's another animal issue that, that's also dear to my heart. So again, like I'm saying, is when you start talking about this, you know, for, given all of the, uh, what everybody's spoken about here today, there's so many important topics, and there's so many things that we need to focus on, and people go, well, you know, relatively speaking, there's like 57 killer whales in captivity. You know, there's probably some thousands of dolphins in captivity, so what's the big deal? But the big deal is, guess what? It's solvable. You know, we can fix this. This is something that we can totally change, and I think it gives people hope that this is something that we can actually, in our lifetime, see it end. And so if we can change that, we'll do what else can we do? And so that's what I like about this particular thing is there's, it's not really hopeless. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end, and I think um, you know, I'm even more hopeful after doing this for a couple of years that it's going to end definitely in my lifetime in this country. Russia and China is a different conversation. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, any right. Yeah, don't buy a ticket. Yeah, exactly. So that's what Rick O'Berry, he's the original dolphin activist. He trained Flipper in the 1960s. Yeah, and, um, and Rick just says when people say, what do I do? If you don't do anything else, just don't buy a ticket and then tell all your friends. I mean, that will change it because it's, it's, SeaWorld is a $2.2 billion company and by no means are they the worst offenders. I mean, they still, unfortunately, they are the best facility and that's tragic because they haven't upgraded their, their pools in 20, since I was there you know, in over 20 years. But they still, they have the veterinary care. Um, they have the um, ability to do rehab. Um, if they're forced to change their business model, they will eventually change their business model. And they could be an awesome rehab facility. They could be doing real science. They could be inviting scientists from all over the world to do lectures there. But they've always been an entertainment uh, facility. And th I think what's going to happen is, you know, if the, tank, if the stock goes any lower, their, their upper level management is going to be dealt with. And if, we, if new management com comes in, it'll change. Um, and they kind of set the standard for the rest of the world because if you have a killer whale, you deal with SeaWorld on some level because they're the ones that know about them. So, so that, yeah, so that is going to change it. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Thank you, guys.